We are live. Yes. Here we go. Here we go. How are we doing, Liam? Yeah, I'm, I'm good. Yourself? Good, good, my man. Good, good. So we'll just let people jump in to the live before we get started. Um, <clears throat> I've got a couple of wee banners here that I've uh, since created since my last show. So, <clears throat> guys, if we're on Facebook and you're jumping on, Give this a wee share. We have got Liam on tonight, who has got an unbelievable story. Um, I'll introduce him properly in a minute. And if you are on YouTube watching, hit that subscribe button so that you know um, and get notified when every show is going to be on. Okay, so <clears throat> Liam. <clears throat> get this on the go. <clears throat> So, mate, first of all, thanks very much for coming on. Oh, that's no problem at all. Yep, absolutely buzzing uh, to hear your full story. <clears throat> I put in touch with you by a great mate of mine, Jamie McBrady. You've been working a bit with him, catching up. Yeah, yeah, he's been mentoring me for, must be over a year now. He's been great help, honestly. That's brilliant. Ah, so I've worked with Jamie a lot and he's top man. Top man. So, yeah, guys... Uh, we're just away to get kicked in. As I said, share this video away. That would be brilliant. Share Liam's story and we will get kicked off. So, mate, thanks a lot um, for jumping on. And uh, I'm just going to ask you to go right back to the very start <clears throat> for your, all your journey and then we will get the ball rolling. Yeah, well, it's... Uh... It's, it's all the way back to the day before my second birthday is when my story really started. I uh, I fell ill with meningococcal septicemia, which is basically a hybrid of both meningitis and sepsis. So it's pretty severe stuff. So I, I think it was after noticing a rash on my tongue, my uh, mum and dad took me up to Nine Wells Hospital in Dundee, where the both of us are from. And uh, yeah, it's uh, upon arrival at the hospital, they confirmed that's what I'd fallen ill with, but they, uh, they couldn't deal with it in Dundee. It was too severe. So they stuck me in an ambulance and gave me a police escort through to uh, York Hill Hospital, uh, Children's Hospital in Glasgow. And it was, uh, for unfortunately, on this day of all days, apparently there was, uh, there was road works on the main roads between Dundee and Glasgow. So I had to take uh, half of the back roads and the long way around. So um, yeah, by the time that we arrived in Glasgow, the uh, the way the way meningococcal septicemia works is that it starts to block the blood flow and clot the blood, starting at the fingertips and the toe tips, and it kind of works its way up the limbs until it reaches the vital organs. At which point, that's it, game over. So uh, by the time that we arrived in Glasgow, the uh, my limbs were turning almost jet black, a kind of bluish colour because there was no there was no circulation getting in. And the doctor said that, look, this is now probably the worst case that we have seen in years, if not decades. He's, he, he's as good as dead. There's absolutely no chance he's going to survive. Yeah. However, if, if they said if I did survive, I would probably be so brain damaged that I wouldn't be able to see, speak or hear. That's how severe it was. So, yeah, they put me into a medically induced coma. I went to the drawing board and started thinking of ways to save my life. Yeah. Um, I've been told that they tried one medication that they said was relatively new at the time. And what that would do is kind of, it would uh, it would unblock the blood, the, the arteries and let the blood flow again. However, they said in the handful of times that this had been used around the world that they knew of, it had thinned the blood so severely that it no longer served its purpose and the patient had died. But um, I believe my my, fa my family realised that their hands were kind of tied at this point and there wasn't really many other options, so they went for it. And uh, well, as you could see by the fact I'm speaking to you now, it didn't kill me, but <laughs> it certainly it, it didn't stop the disease, it just slowed it down a bit. And it, it got to the point that essentially the only other option was amputation. And that, that's what they did, they amputated all four limbs, that, both legs below the knee, left arm through, uh, sorry, the left arm above the elbow, the right arm above the elbow, uh, sorry, through the elbow. And uh, yeah, so this is, like you said, that was the day before my second birthday, I fell ill, so that's all I've really known. And uh, 
basically, yeah, it's, uh, after amputation, they weren't sure if there'd been any sort of internal sort of brain damage. Yeah. There was sort of signs of life. They realised that I was responding to sort of audio and visual, but that doesn't tell you the full picture. They were looking for some form of communication. And uh, I've, I've been told that a few days passed, and then one day out of nowhere, I was looking out the window of the hospital room, and I said, train. <laughs> just just one word. Yeah. Was, uh, my family looked over, and they realised that I was looking out the window, and about half a mile down the track or something, I, I seen a train shining the light into the, 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 uh, the bedroom, and yeah. it pointed it out almost. And that, that's when they realised that sort of in that moment that somehow... A miracle had taken place. Yep. Uh, yeah, but for me, that uh, that part of my story doesn't really hold much emotional baggage over me. It's I, I can't really remember it. I only know that story through the stories of other people telling me what happened. The, the difficult part for me was having to learn how to live my entire life without hands or feet, which you can probably imagine is quite difficult. Yep. How did, your, how did you, like, obviously, hearing through your, your family and stuff like that, mate, how did you adapt um, at such an early age? To be honest, I think one of the reasons that I adapted so well was the fact that <laughs> I never had a plan B, that there was no backup to having all four limbs amputated. It's either you adapt or that's it, you're just a vegetable for the rest of your life. Yeah. So it's, uh, vegetable's probably a bit harsh, but you, you know what I mean? It's... Yeah. It, it's a situation where you, you kind of have to adapt to the best of your abilities. And uh, yeah, so within months of being amputated, I went to walk on prosthetic legs. And that, that was kind of like the, the early sign of the attitude I would have throughout my entire childhood. And that right. I, got, I got to the point where uh, I, I never really held myself back because I understood that like, in order to find out what I'm truly capable of, I've got to... I've got to keep pushing my limits. I've got to keep breaking my own boundaries. Otherwise, I'm going to struggle to live the life. So, um, yeah, I, I, was, I always had this fiercely independent attitude from a young age. It got to the point where I, I uh, when I went to school, primary school, I, uh, I was able to sort of keep up with the rest of the class, no problem, to be oh. honest, because of, basically because of that attitude of refusing to accept that there was any different. And I'm quite grateful as well that at school as well, all the other kids and the teachers and that just treated me as if I was a, a normal human being, which that's, I suppose I am. And it's, yeah, it, was quite, it was a good place to, to grow up. And through time, I learned how to do all the important things like eat, drink, look after myself. And I, I always joke that I've got better handwriting than most people with hands just by holding my hand and writing like that. So it's, uh, yeah, it's uh, just through trial and error, really, you just, if I picked up a pencil one way and my writing wasn't overly neat, I would try it out a different way and just through years and years of sticking at it and the resilience, I found a way to do everything that you really need to do in life in order to live alone, or to be independent. That, so it actually, it got to the point where I now I live alone independently and uh, the really? only the only adaptation in my entire house is the uh, the cords on my blinds. Like they're, yeah. they're, they're too high up, I couldn't reach them. But the thing is, people with them couldn't reach them that high. So uh, I got somebody in my family to tie a piece of string to all the cords so they've been lengthened. But um, yeah. other than that, yeah, I could just do everything by holding my two arms together. So, for example, just like... Spot on, mate. <clears throat> I mean, a, so yeah, that, that was all the sort of necessary skills that I needed in life were developed in my early childhood because I, I didn't make any excuses whatsoever. I just fired on with it. Did you feel different when you were growing up, mate? Ken, was your attitude towards stuff different, looking at other people, Ken, who were, who, like, never had any, um, well, they had full able body? Yeah, the... Uh, See, like, as it, like I said, I've sp specifically focused on my youngest sort of part of childhood here because that's when I was so determined. However, uh, when, I, when I hit 13, 14, I became extremely anxious, borderline paranoid about how I appeared. 
Yeah. And I started to, I think we all know from our own experience is that being a teenager is a difficult experience as it is. But yeah. when half of your body's missing and you're, you're covered in scars, you really start to look at yourself in the mirror and think to yourself, is this really who I am? And to be honest, nobody really ever said anything that derogatory to me. It was all in my own head that I seemed to bring myself down. I would jump to my own crazy conclusions telling myself that I wasn't good enough. And uh, yeah, I became quite withdrawn as a teenager, to be honest, quite, I was never a shy person, but I just didn't want to bother people with my <laughs> with my existence. I became hesitant to ask for help in certain places. And I got to the point that like, even I had friends at school, but I specifically didn't speak to them in school because I didn't want to burden them, burden them with my, so I, I, company, like, I didn't want to burden them with my presence. But nobody had ever suggested that was the case. However, in my own head, for some reason, I just seemed to jump to this anxious conclusion. So, yeah, that, that my, my own mental health tormented me until not too long ago, to be honest. Yeah. <clears throat> what was like the turning point, mate? I kind of, <laughs> I kind of yo-yoed in and out of anxiety and depression as a teenager. I was in denial the whole time that there was nothing wrong with me. I was convinced that every Dundonian was miserable. So, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, it's a. Uh, I got myself to university eventually after school. After a couple of years, I injured my leg on a study trip. I fell behind on the coursework, and uh, I struggled to catch up again. And basically, I blamed my own body the same way I did at secondary school. I started to say, look, if I wasn't disabled, this wouldn't have happened. And like I said, there's no plan B. You, you can never get out of being disabled. That's who I am as a person. So to actually blame this for my misery and my failures in life is quite a, a harsh thing to do. So, um, yeah, I, eventually I, I dropped out. I couldn't keep up. I, it got far too much. It was a burden on me. And uh, I spent a year and a half unemployed. And uh, it was a complete wilderness. I, I hated it. It was the whole time blaming myself, ended up at rock bottom questioning what the point of life was. And uh, my turning point actually happened in one day. One day. It's like it's like the kind of cliche story, like when somebody walks into a certain situation and a light bulb goes off and that's it, their life's never the same. And you yeah. listen to these stories and you think, no chance. But that that's genuinely what happened to me. I was uh, eventually it took me a year to work up the courage to start looking for jobs. And uh one day when I was meant to be looking for jobs, I've got the attention span of a goldfish, so I ended up on YouTube watching whatever. <laughs> and I ended up watching a TEDx video about finding purpose. Yep. And uh, before the end of the video, before the end of the video, I figured out what it was that I wanted to do in life. Yep. And uh, I realised that, well, I'll describe the video. The video asked me what qualifications I have in life. And I thought, <laughs> if I had to pass an exam to leave school, I'd probably still be there. But I was thinking too literally about it. But I thought, wait, I've got a lot of qualifications with like the highs and lows of life. So I just haven't to stick at it and grind through horrible times. Yeah. But I, I didn't really know what use that would be to anybody. I, don't, I didn't know how that would give me a career. Yeah. The next question was, how can you use your qualifications or experience to positively impact the life of, well, either your own life or the lives of others? And I just, I just thought kind of half-heartedly, well, I don't know, I could maybe come out, speak about it or something, encourage people. And like I said, the light bulb just kind of went off in my head. I was like, that's it, sorted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> since that day, that was September 2018, and since that day, my, my entire drive and ambition has been to just help other people through tough situations, because we, we all have difficult times. I know what it's like. I, I don't see it as a competition. A lot of people look at me and say, oh, compared to your problems, my problems are nothing, but I, I disagree. I, I think for as long as you view something as a problem, then it is a problem. It's a mindset thing. And I realised that I could actually help people with that mindset and alter their view on life to just strive on and create the best existence for themselves. Mate, it's mental that you say that about um, like it all happened in a day for you because it was very similar for, for me and what happened to me. 
Um, but the amount of people who I speak to who say exactly the same, that they watched the video or they heard someone speak, and that's what's given me like massive motivation to bring people on like to you, or people with powerful stories where I've turned their life around, because it just might be this video that somebody watches. It just might be that clip, that interview, that we, and then the penny drops for somebody and goes, fuck, well, here, I need to get my finger out some sort of way. Yeah, that, that's, exa that's exactly the approach, and it's also as well, I think what's kept me driven through this as well is that I understand that my purpose now is not, it's not inward looking, it's outward looking. Yeah. So my purpose in life is to help other people and that brings a bit of weight in itself. So yeah. I feel now if I was to kind of give up, I wouldn't just be letting myself down, I'd be letting other people down. Because uh, even initially it took me, I think, like I, I struggled with my career until earlier or sort of mid to late last year. Yeah. And uh, I think if it was anything else, even like I said, university, I hit a bit of pressure and I dropped out. Whereas with this, because I'm so strongly identified with what it is that I want to do and to help other people, I've kept on pushing through difficult times, such as getting my career up and running and uh, just staying resilient even through this pandemic. Mate, how, how mental is it when you do make that flick, when you do decide it's time to change and you start moving forward, how other like amazing people start to become attracted into your life, the people that you meet, it's bang, it leads on to the next person, to the next person. Yeah, there's, there's definitely, that's definitely a part of it as well, is just kind of, I've introduced myself to an entire community that I didn't even know existed. Yep. So I, the whole the whole motivation, mindset, attitude sort of thing, I, I didn't even know that was a, a, an ex, in existence. I didn't know it was a career. In fact, the day that I, I decided to become a speaker, I decided to become a speaker before I even knew if speaking was a thing. <laughs> so uh, I googled it, I, t I typed in amputee motivational speaker into uh, um, Google. Yeah, I'll pop the guy named Nick Vucic, yep. who I'm not sure if you've heard of, but he's, he's a yep. amputee and he, he's lost all four limbs to an even lesser extent than my left arm. And my, my first thought when I seen that was, oh, I can't compete with that. Because <laughs> 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 like, like, mindset just drilled into me that seeing everything as this burden, this obstacle that had to be overcome. But by the end of that day, I came to my senses and I said, look, do you know what? If this guy who's missing even more than I am, he can do it, he can emigrate to California, live the good life, then why can't I? Yep. Amazing. He's got a great... Is he Australian? Is he Australian? Yeah, he's Australian. I think he's got, like, Slovakian heritage or something like that. He's Australian. And, uh, yeah, he's a... Yeah, most of his talks are mostly from a religious point of view. But, yeah. yeah he's so, good as well, isn't he? He's, he's... Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, no, brilliant, mate. Brilliant. So, with the speaking and things like that, what's your who's your inspiration? Obviously, we've just mentioned that there, but what what's what do you see yourself going? <laughs> I, t I try not to speak too much about this in case the ego comes out. <laughs> Thinking to myself, stadium tours, but nah, nah, it's not about that. It's uh, like I, I don't know. I, I just like 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 you said, it's uh. It was one video that changed my life. You said yourself it was one day that changed your perspective. It's if I if I get say ten years down the line and I, I know for a fact that I've helped even just a handful of people change their life into just creating something fulfilling for themselves, then that, that's enough to I'll I'll die a happy person if that's the case. So yeah, as long as I'm I'm I i do not want to be too specific about my end goals, to be honest. I don't look too far ahead into the future because uh, I, I like to kind of go with the flow. I understand that a lot of life it's uh, enjoying the surprises and the unpredictability of the situations, but I just kind of, as long as I'm continually improving, as long as I'm continually bettering the person that I was yesterday, I'm happy enough. <laughs> as long as I'm helping people and I'm bettering myself, that's that's all I could ever ask for in life. Brilliant, man. What's it like going into and doing these talks? How do you feel? <laughs> originally, originally I was uh, hesitant because I, I remember, as I told you, as a teenager, I was an extremely anxious person, in particular about my appearance and disability. So uh, 
I prefer to kind of fade to the background and not be seen. So any time in my English class where I had to do a talk, I hated it. Like, I, I properly, it was the one thing in school that it, it just churned my stomach. And I, I used to just stand there and mince my words and just completely ruin it for myself. And uh, I remember one time, I must have been like 15, and I was standing doing a talk in front of the class, and I was actually shaking that visibly that a girl at the back of the class said, are you okay after that? <laughs> like she could see me shaking from the back. So um, yeah, going into speaking wasn't exactly a career I thought I would ever consider. Yep. Uh, yeah, but my first talk was a little bit shaky, but from there on, it just kind of improved time and time again. It's, it's the same in any with anything in life. It's the first time you do anything, it's going to be beyond your comfort zone. It's not often somebody does something first time and they're an expert at it. It usually it takes time and practice, and through time and practice and sticking at it, you you get better. So I'm I'm now at a stage where I could comfortably talk in front of probably any size of audience. It doesn't bother me. I've I've realised that speaking to five people or speaking to five hundred people, it's it, it comes with the same responsibilities and the same skills. So, yeah, it's a, I feel I'm in a good place as a speaker now, at least skill wise. That's brilliant, mate. Yeah, I always remember the first, Jamie. Maybe told you this before, but he stole it on a live as well. The first time I ever got up to speak, it was like 150 people, and I got got up to the front of the room, and I totally forgot my name. <laughs> totally, it was like. And then I went, oh, I've just brain farted <laughs> in front of the whole crowd. I, I think in my first talk, uh, there was one part that I, uh, I mixed up my words. And like, if I'm having a conversation with somebody and I mix up my words, for some reason I go, eh, and stick my tongue out. And I'm standing in a room with like, near on 100 people and I did it and I went, eh. And then I realised what I did, I was like, oh, no, this is going to be on film. <laughs> But like, like you said, through time you get better. That's good, mate. That's good. So going back to when, like that day, when it was like bang, was there anything else that you started to add to your life along with it that helped you progress? Yeah, definitely. It's uh, I recognise that in order to progress this as a career, it's not just a case of me standing up on the stage and telling people my story. I, I, I genuinely want to help people as much as possible. So in order to do that, I need to help myself as much as possible. So I started investing my time in the, the world of self-improvement. And like I said, I didn't know any of this existed prior to that day. And it was weird. It was kind of liberated my mind. It was this kind of, whoa, hang on a minute here. Life can actually be, like you can make a successful, a fulfilling, a happy life. It's 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 a choice, essentially. It's, a, it's something that you can attract into your life through your own actions and your own thoughts. So from that day forward, I wasn't just building my own career I, and I wasn't just helping other people. I was actually improving myself as a human being going forward to the point now that I, I honestly, personally believe that anybody could learn anything in life as long as they put in the hours, as long as they... I, th I think that any big task in life is just a series of small tasks added on to each other. And when you break it down like that, absolutely anything is manageable. So... Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't just a career, my entire attitude towards life, my entire mindset just shifted entirely. That's class, mate. How did you start breaking things down? <laughs> well, first of all, I, I needed to actually speak before an audience. Honestly, the, the, the most difficult thing I had to do in my career so far was find that first talk. Actually, I'm, I'm talking nonsense, sorry. The first talk came relatively easy because my auntie got me it. I was with the bank she works with and I uh, got two talks, got quite good feedback and I thought to myself, right, this is brilliant, this is going to be quite easy. It, <laughs> it took me more than six months after that to get my second talk and uh, yeah, so I, 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 struggled, I struggled with that initially but through time and practice and just kind of figuring out and teaching myself what works, what doesn't, trial and error. Like, again, as a child, how I learned to write, draw, look after myself, live independently, I had to apply the same stuff to my career. And I got there in the end. I think finally, I, I finally cracked the code on how to find people who would be interested in what I've got to offer. And I knew how, I finally cracked the code on how to find events. And as soon as I cracked the code, within two weeks, 
this whole lockdown happened. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> terrible timing. Like, just as I felt I was getting there, it was just, it felt as if it was torn from me. Definitely, mate. Yeah, I think a lot of people have felt the same. And <clears throat> catching big momentum coming off the back of the new year into the can, first couple of months, um, we definitely did feel that. Can just like oh, flick a switch. It was like somebody turned the tap off. <laughs> Uh, so, going in about your your um, your talks in that, is there anything that you want to say, like a, a message you want to bring, which you would like ultimately you, you would speak about during them talks? Yeah, there's a, 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 a tend to focus on two different areas based upon my own experiences. Uh, I realise that. <laughs> I don't want to be one of these speakers who's just a kind of jack of all trades, reads something in a book and then regurgitates it in front of an audience. I recognise that for me to be a, a successful speaker, I need to speak from a place of experience or qualification. Yeah. And my, my experience primarily lies within staying resilient, taking action through difficult times and kind of just pushing yourself for better. And on, on the, the flip side, I talk about kind of the, my mental health experiences. Um, and in terms of the mental health side of things, I, I specifically make sure that I don't tell people what is right and what is wrong. In that case, I, I do tend to just talk about my experiences and what people get from it is what people get from it. So I realise it's quite a, a fragile area. However, in terms of the sort of motivation, uh, mindset, action, resilience, that sort of stuff, I, uh, I've, I've, uh, I've looked back over my life. I've looked at my good times, my bad times. And I've realised what worked for me and what let me down. And I've kind of, I've managed to basically categorise my, my entire attitude as a child into three main areas of mindset, action and resilience. I, I recognise that before anything, you need to be in the right mindset. So if you don't believe you can achieve something, then you won't. Simple as that. <laughs> it's, it's a case of if, if you see somebody in a situation where they have achieved some milestone, they, can't, they had to believe at some stage that it was possible in order to keep pushing themselves. Otherwise, if they didn't believe it was possible, they would have gave up long before then. And then I, yeah, you, but, but also, also I recognise as well that a lot of people get too caught up in the mindset area. So they try and think themselves into a better life without really taking any action to improve it. So the whole... Well, what's it called? Yeah, uh, there's a documentary and a book about it. The, the law of attraction. That's it. So I, I, the secret. I, yeah, that's it. I watched the documentary the first time, and I, my mind was blown. I was, I was this is amazing. Then I realised, hang on a minute, I've actually got to make this stuff happen now. Yep. So I, I can't, I can't just think that it's going to magically happen. I need to actually put things in place that's going to keep me progressing towards the target that I want to achieve. Yep. Otherwise, it won't happen. I think that's the only, like obviously I love the secret, eh? but the the that's the one thing that's missing for the message, eh? Mm, yeah, so I think, I think the, the 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 thing from that story is that it's too. I think people get too caught up in the thinking stage, the the, the visualization, which don't get me wrong, is important. It's definitely good to have a yeah. vision of what it is you want to achieve, but yeah, it's, it's honestly you you need to make it happen. Though it's not just going to fall in your lap. I've always said, like, obviously they say, dream, believe, achieve. And it's like, dream, believe, work your ass off and achieve. Yeah, de definitely, definitely. It's, in there. You, you look at most, most not, not even necessarily successful people, even fulfilled people, people who are in any situa good situation in life, right. chances are they've got to work for it. Chances, <laughs> chances are it wasn't like that forever. Yeah. The, the, probably a time where they, they questioned whether it was worth it but they kept going through all the difficult times and yeah that, that's the third stage of what i talk about is resilience yeah. as you know, like i've said multiple times now it's it, it as, a, as a child learning to do all the basic things in life i never cracked it first time it's it's not like i could look at everybody else and copy from them because they had hands and feet i had to figure it out my way and honestly it's like a the example of so, for example, like when you're a child, you learn to walk by just throwing yourself up on your feet, walking, falling over, getting back up and doing it again and just repeating it until you finally get the result that you need. That's, that's, that's essentially what the majority of life is. It's just that 
a series of consequences that if you don't push yourself towards them, then they're, they're not going to happen. 100%. Yeah, and I believe like resilience can definitely be learned. Mm, definitely, I'm. De <laughs> I'm still at a state like I'm not one to portray myself as a master of resilience, a master of productivity, and all that stuff. I, I still have the highs and the lows. Eh? For the most part, like so, for example, when I was unemployed, every single day I woke up and thought I can't be bothered. Whereas now it's it's few and far between, but it still does happen on the odd occasion. Look, Nobody's indestructible. Everybody has a day where they wake up and think, nah, not, not today. That's a, it's a, it's a... Sorry to interrupt you. I think what the thing is, because a lot of the time with social media and that now, when people look and see other people's lives, they think, oh, they're on it. They're on it every day. They're smashing it. They're, like, they're getting after it. Well, really, a lot of the time, people only want to show you the, the best bits. So yeah. it's like when, you think about your, when you think about yourself, you're like, oh, man, I've had a few days off. You start to be tough on yourself and hard on yourself. Where, where really, like everybody's taking a wee break at times. Because mm. even, even in the past. So, for example, I uh, I sometimes now, I often find my problems the other way around. I now occasionally push myself that a little bit too hard to yeah. break the point to the point where I I just think I, I can't do this. So uh, I I took this lockdown really badly at the beginning in the first month essentially and just disappeared because uh before the lockdown i was working 12 hour shifts i was getting up at a decent time in the morning and i was just getting on with the work like i said i finally cracked the code on how to get myself out there and before people who create event events so uh on it that, that that drove me but 12 hour shifts and then all of a sudden the events industry overnight almost disappeared <laughs> so I went from having 12 hours work to hang on a minute, how am I going to fill my time here? Yeah. And it, it just cracked me, I thought, I don't know, it's, the resilience disappeared for an entire month where I sat there just vegetating, watching TV non-stop, <laughs> Netflix and Amazon. So, like, when we're going to be closed down for three or four months, but is that work still going to be there, or is, is it... Now that you've built uh, the contacts list, they're going to create a backlog so that when, you, when we come out of this end on the other side, um, is there going to be even more for you to get through? There's different theories. <laughs> and then, to be honest, I don't think anybody knows. I think everything at the moment, every expert, I believe, is probably just taking a bit of a stab in the dark. Yep. But, uh, there's one theory that nobody's going to have any money to spend on speakers and events and stuff like that. The whole industry is just going to fade for a, a while. And then there's another perspective that this pandemic is going to weed out a lot of the speakers who are just going to say, ah, nah, do you know what, this isn't for me. And then when we come out the other end, all the events that have been postponed and pushed until a later date are going to have vacancies. So there's going to be loads of events, but not enough speakers, which means there's going to be a, a, a field day. But we got, I, I don't know, to be honest, what the future holds, I think. One of the troubles in life is that we spend a bit too much time trying to predict what's going to happen. Yeah. We spend too much time concerned about the uncertainty of the future. And, and it kind of it seems to paralyze us because we're always trying to second guess ourselves. We're always trying to be one step ahead. And actually, I uploaded a video about this on my Facebook page yesterday saying that uh, life's almost a bit like a film in the, in the way that you're. You're trying to guess what's going to happen in the next scene, but nine times out of ten, you get it wrong. You don't know what's going to happen. So I, I don't want to get too ahead of myself thinking about this career and how I come out the end of this pan, uh, pandemic. I'm just trying to think of how to adapt and thrive at this moment in time. But and you're getting gigs just now, mate. You're getting the gigs online. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a, I spent the... Uh, after my... Uh, <laughs> After my mental breakdown at the start of the pandemic, when I watched who knows how many hours worth of TV, I eventually realised that there, things are going to move online. Spent a lot of time developing an online package, which I'm now starting to spread out there, and I've already got myself a bit of interest in that. So, yes, yeah, a lot of life, whether it be because you're disabled, because you're in a tight situation, because there's a pandemic, a lot of life is basically just having to adapt to the circumstances that are thrown your way. And this, the, the, 
the quicker, the, the stronger you react, the quicker you react, then the, the better it's going to be. Yep. What would you say to people who are like <clears throat> struggling right now? I've got that bit of doubt about themselves. See, in the past, I would usually talk about self-belief and understanding that, you know what, you, you, you can you, you can do it. You are, you are worthy of creating a fulfilling life, a better career, this, that, the next thing. However, I recognise that this whole lockdown, this whole pandemic, it's beyond anybody's control. That, that, that's quite literally what a virus is. It's something that's so far out of control that nobody can really do anything about it. So um, at, at this moment in time, I think it's just a case of trying to look after yourself as much as possible and not, not be too harsh on yourself. I don't, I don't think we should hound ourselves at this moment in time saying, oh, you should try harder, you should be doing this, that, the next thing. Because the whole world is basically shut down. It's, it's beyond your control. It's, but at the same time, I don't think we should loosen our grip so much to the extent that our whole schedule and life falls apart within the space of a few months. Like, so when I uh, took a bit of time off at the start of the pandemic, my schedule <laughs> it went right out the window. I was I went from getting up at like eight o'clock to getting up at about one o'clock in the afternoon. I, I was going to bed at like one in the morning, sleeping for twelve hours. So <laughs> and there's a balance. No, I mean there's a balance between completely just letting everything slide and then being so harsh on yourself that you crack yourself. It's a, it's, it's. I think now is maybe a bit of time that you should just. Give yourself a bit of leeway, a bit of sympathy to say, look, this is a little bit beyond our control. We'll just ride it out for a few months and see where we end up. Yeah, mate, I was exactly the same. I mean, it was sort of like the first few weeks was like a hot little holiday period. Mm. It was like, oh, completing episode or episode after series on Netflix. Kind of. And then after a wee while, mate, I was exactly the same. I was just like, I can't continue to just keep going through this day and day. We've got to find it somewhere inside you to get yourself moving again. I think that's the reason why Tiger King was so popular. <laughs> I, I don't think it was actually that outstanding a documentary. Don't get me wrong, it was good, but it's the fact that it came out more or less of the week that everybody was at home from work. I think there's no coincidence there. Everybody tuned in, went mad for it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was good though. <laughs> well, it was a strange one. It's the only documentary I think I've ever watched where I've not liked it any single, like, any one of the people in it. It wasn't like a good side and a bad side. The whole situation was just, oh, hang on a minute, this is a bit dodgy. Yep. I've been speaking to everybody about The Last Dance. Have you watched it yet, mate? Oh, not yet, not yet. I actually, I actually within the last couple of weeks, cancelled my Netflix and my Amazon to kind of push myself back into staying as productive as possible. It's actually working, to be honest. I, I don't spend much time watching TV at all now. I'm, I'm back into not quite 12 hour shifts, but working a, a decent routine. So I've, uh, I've not had a chance to watch it, but I'm sure I'll, I'll definitely get around to it. Ah, oh, mate, it's unbelievable. Especially for like and changing your mindset for mm. people. Well, oh, just, just basically going that next level. I think he's a prime example for a lot of motivators out there on how you can continue to just push yourself and more and more to be the best, to never accept anything other than, never accept anything less even. Yep, uh, unbelievable. So get that Netflix back on, mate, and get it watched. <laughs> I'll try to hold my career up just a little bit first, so I've got that kind of safety net to give myself a bit of time off. <laughs> what do you look like then, Liam? Sorry? Writing material? Are you like planning for Are you writing material, like books and such? No, for your for your for your speaking and stuff like that. I well, I'm, at the moment I'm uh, I'm using this time to uh, I'm basically I'm recreating my main talk. Yep. From scratch, I actually I enrolled in a, an online course with a, a well known speaker who talks to other speakers about how to create the best talk and. Honestly, it was a. It could be career defining when I get the opportunity to actually use the material. But it's a, I'm in the process of completely reevaluating everything that I'm putting out there and reconstructing it. And even the the talk that I offer to businesses at the moment, the whole virtual thing, it's a, that is focused primarily on my experiences both in childhood, but within the lockdown as well. So it's it's kind of this is basically another chapter in my life of 
something that I could speak about, something that I've had to overcome, something that I did initially struggle with and eventually had to just push myself through. Yep. <clears throat> do, you, uh, do you train a lot, Liam? Train? As in, like, training other people? Yes. Yeah, it's, uh, um, I said, yeah, there, yeah, no. Nah. <laughs> nah, uh, it's not something that I've yet, I've, I've not got into it yet. I'm, I'm thinking about it in the future, but at this moment in time, I feel that before I go into something as in depth and personal as to like a one to one, I want to continue. I want to develop my skills a bit more. I want to do a bit more on the motivation side, consume a bit more motivational content, read a few more books and such to just kind of because I, I'm wary that I don't want to go into things too early. Yeah. At the same time, I don't want to procrastinate to the extent where I keep pushing it off and off and off and never get around to it and basically fall into my old habits. But at the same time, before I get into any anything like one-to-ones, I want to kind of develop my skills a little bit further. Yeah. I also have a little bit of a little bit of a what's it called imposter syndrome as well when it comes to one-to-ones. I'm a little bit like one-to-one training and coaching. I'm a bit hesitant because I recognise that like. Okay, I've had, like I'm 23 years old and I've had more experience in 23 years than most people would have in 23 lifetimes. But at the same time in my head, I'm thinking to myself, ah, I'm only 23 here, could I really be like taking on by other people and help them improve their life when they're in their 40s, maybe 50s? I, I don't know. So it's, I think I need to get over that barrier before anything. <laughs> yeah. How much working with Jamie has that been helping you with things like that? Yeah, no, it's, it's definitely opened my mind as well. It's a... Because like I said, when I went into this, I didn't know if this was a thing. <laughs> I didn't understand what the world of motivation really was. So to find somebody else who lives basically just down the road, who does something extremely similar to what I do, then, yeah, that's, I, I, I opened my mind to say, look, hang on a minute. And again, it comes back to, look, if, if he can do it, I can do it. If somebody else can do something, then so can you. Obviously, I'm slightly restricted by certain physical limitations, but in the case of mindset and motivation, I don't think those limitations really apply. So, yeah, no, it's it's been it's been crucial. It's, uh, Jamie and a couple of other mentors have had as well. It's just surrounding yourself with the right people who say, look, do you know what? If, if I can do it, so can you. Yeah, that's definitely been vital for me as well, like with, just with anything that I've done. Kind of when you're bouncing off of other like-minded people mm-hmm. and it yeah, and sometimes when you're you are in that rut as well, kind of you just need to bounce your thoughts off of somebody. And when it come when you've got that that sound in ear, just to say, "Here, come on, well, I've well, well, been there, well, I'll go through it." And definitely, yeah. I've heard it out. So, mate, any other wee message you want to bring for the night? I think it's basically just a case of, do you know what? <laughs> Sometimes in life, bad things happen. Sometimes in life, good things happen. Either way, you need to keep just pushing on. It doesn't matter if life tears you limb for limb. There's a, you can still achieve more than you think you can. You've just got to keep pushing through and believe that it is possible. It's a, that's that's the, the fastest and easiest way to summarise what it is that I believe in. That's quality, mate. That's quality. Well, I'm just going to give you a wee plug, Liam. Yeah. Uh, so... Guys, on Instagram, uh, follow Liam at uh, Zero Limit. I'll get the t-shirt in. There we go. T-shirt in, <laughs> definitely. And same as your Facebook as well, mate, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, Facebook. To be fair, I don't use Instagram that often. It's something that I'm meaning to get into, but I've always pushed it aside. But uh, yeah, Facebook, um, I've just rebooted my content recently. I'm putting a lot more effort into the videos I'm uploading. I'm, put- <laughs> I'm actually I'm filming them with a decent microphone added in decent footage, a little bit of emotional background music. I'm actually going all in with Facebook now. So yeah, if you're if you're into the whole motivation, continuing to push yourself for better, just creating a better fulfilling life for yourself, then yeah, follow follow on Facebook or Instagram. Brilliant mate. Listen, I've got some uh, comments coming in. Guys, if anybody's got any questions for Liam while we're on the live, that would be brilliant fire away. Uh, but we've got some uh, questions or just people saying so inspiring. Um, amazing story, very inspirational young guy. Um, action is the only answer. Action is almost 80%. You're simply doing something good. Good. Let me see. 
What else have we got? Refreshing to hear you speaking, Liam. Liam, lovely young lad. Had the privilege of having him in my football class when he was in primary school. Nicky Davidson. Nicola Davidson. That uh, uh, rings a bell. Yeah. I was looking to look into it, though, to be honest. It was a long time ago. I'm struggling to remember last week. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's probably more to do with the lockdown than time, isn't it? <laughs> uh, she, we, me and Nicky were in the same team together, Dundee West, back at under 12s. Um, and then other people saying amazing story and that, mate. So, uh, guys, if you've enjoyed the story, um, give it a share because you just never know who um, is going to come across Liam's story and how well it is going to impact them. So, yeah, thanks very much for your comments. And anything else you want to add before we go, mate? I, I think I've got most things in there. Uh, but uh, thanks for having me. It's been a good experience. It's the first time. Actually, I tell why it's the second time I've done a live, but it's, a, it's something that I really need to get into. Uh, here, mate, I've just, I'm just getting going as well, okay? It's only like, what have I done? Five or, five or six lives now. Started on Instagram, now I've brought it over onto Facebook and um, and, and YouTube. And uh, here, you're, you're, you're on the spot, but you just got to go with it, eh? Absolutely. There's sometimes, you, sometimes you plan a bit too much. I'm guilty of that. I, I, honestly, I. I before this career, I made multiple business plans, and eventually I was like, do you know what? I've just got to get on with it. And I, and I wonder why it took me six months to get my second gig. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, six months is not mate. You're doing amazing. Can you uh, only even two years in yet? Uh, no, I'm now a year and a half in. So it's a it's only now that I'm starting to reap the benefits. I'm starting to actually get my name out there. So it's a, I go, it goes to show that anything anything good in life is worth working for. Yep. Well, mate, I'll definitely be having a chat with you once we once we come off and things like that because I would love you to come in and speak to speak to our team. That would be amazing. Definitely. Uh, right, my man. Spot on. Thank you very much, guys. And we shall catch you all later. See you.